Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us on Wellversed. I'm your host, Jazzy Cho, and today we will be learning with Justin Kahn, the co founder of Twitch, the world's largest live streaming platform, and Fractal, a Web3 gaming NFT marketplace. He's also a technology investor at Y Combinator and Goat Capital. So, why is this serial entrepreneur who sold Twitch to Amazon for about a billion dollars? back again to build in Web3 for gaming NFTs? Let's find out together. Justin Khan, welcome to the show. How are you today? Mm, amazing. I'm doing good. To get us started, I want to dive a little deeper into one of your many superpowers, which I think is storytelling. Were you always a good storyteller? No. You know, actually, first I'll say, I don't think I have that many superpowers, to be honest, but I am a really good storyteller, but I wasn't always actually, it's very learned behavior. You know, I was always a shy kid when I was growing up. I was, um, didn't really know how to connect with people uh, very well. And I think I started, you know, learning how to tell stories. I always had like interesting ideas, I think, or like ideas that, you know, kind of formed the basis for interesting stories. And then, uh, but I really started like learning how to tell stories as an entrepreneur, because that's part of your job is to get out there and get people excited about something, some vision of the future. And so uh, I would be forced to, you know, you're like recruiting an employee or raising money or telling a report about a new product that you're releasing. Those are all forms of storytelling. So I would kind of through doing, and then eventually I became pretty good. You know, 18 years in, I'm, I'm good now. Do you have any like funny stories about when you first had to go out and pitch. Yeah, well, I mean, I have some funny story about like how shy I was. That's maybe helpful. You know, a lot of people look at me now and they're like, oh, man, you're such a good storyteller or fundraiser, recruiter. You know, how I, how could I get there? But I remember when I was in the sixth grade, I did this uh, presentation. It was like at a summer camp, like um, you had to do a report or something. It was like an educational summer camp. I don't know. Never go to those. But, um, you know, I was like at this camp and I was supposed to present in front of the audience, the, the class, you know, it was like 10 people or something. And I read my report with my, like I put the paper literally in front of my face so I couldn't see people. And I was like reading it. So, cause I was so shy. That's the base of where I was coming from. And then uh, I remember to one of my uh, pitch meetings early day in the early days when I started Kiko, I actually ended up bringing my mom because, uh, she was in town and kind of like wanted to see it. And I was like scared to go alone anyway. So I was like, uh, I brought my mom to this pitch meeting. He ended up investing. This guy, uh, the investor, Alex, was a friend of mine. You know, he ended up investing, which was kind of incredible. I mean, it's a little bit like, you know, when you roll in with your mom, either that's like you have no confidence at all or you're like so confident. You're like, hey, fuck, I brought my mom to this meeting. Did, did know, the so investors maybe, know that your mom came? Yeah, I mean, she was sitting right there. Yeah. Oh, oh my gosh, wait, that's so cute. <laughs> yeah, I'm a very supportive mom. What advice do you have for those who aren't the best storytellers, moreover, aren't quite confident yet to go out and pitch an idea? Well, I, you, the key to get better at anything is practice and exposure therapy always helps you if you're scared to do something. So just go start doing it, you know? Putting yourself out there. Yeah, you got to put yourself out there. You got to seek positions of discomfort. I bring up the topic of storytelling because right now I think what the Web3 space needs and really like any industry or idea that's new and different is a good storyteller to help those who aren't familiar with the concepts to understand and bridge that gap. What are your thoughts? Well, I mean, I think actually Web3 is, has like been built around the story, right? Like the story is that uh, decentralization is important and self-sovereignty is important. And then, um, and having one company in control of, you know, major parts of the internet or an old oligopoly of a small number of companies is like bad for people, right? It's bad for your fin the financial system. It's bad for, you know, social media. It's bad for like any sort of critical infrastructure and in commerce or, or finance. And so um, I really think that like the whole value system, or the, all the value that's been created in Web3 has been built around that story and people believing it. What do you think about the trajectory of how the industry is building out? Like, are we staying true to this idea of decentralization? Well, I, decentralization is just that, you know, there's, there's an infrastructure that distributed infrastructure that's run by many parties and some way to build consensus of what happens in that infrastructure, right? So I would say that um, this idea that I got from Pomp was that like, you know, there's maybe different applications have different needs for different levels of decentralization, right? If you're like 
transferring millions or billions of dollars of Bitcoin, you want like the most decentralization, most trustless uh, protocol pro possible, right? And you're willing to trade off, you know, speed for that or cost, right? Um, whereas if you're, you know, maybe doing something like uh, buying and selling virtual goods in a game, um, or the level of tr you know trust you're willing to have maybe higher because you know the stakes are lower, right? So like I think there's different levels of decentralization and different implementations. People talk about crypto as like one thing, but it's it's really not. It's like it's a it's a whole ecosystem and and kind of Cambrian explosion of different projects. You've mentioned that the current climate in Web three reminds you of the early days of live streaming. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I meant more from like my experience as a builder, you know, so for me, when I was building, it was like kind of the, the web three right now reminds me of like being in web two in 2006, where back then people were discovering the atomic units of what we could build on the internet, like tweets, sharing photos on Instagram, like all these things were, it wasn't clear that people were going to want to do this stuff, right? And so people were like inventing this stuff and like live streams, one of them, uh, something we were very early on at. Uh, we, we did very early on. And then, you know, we were like inventing new human behaviors or so not inventing new human behaviors, but putting them online, right? And like new atomic units of interaction. And today in the Web3 space, it feels like we're doing that, but through the lens of value, like how do people, you know, what are the types of virtual items that people value online, right? Um, how do people exchange value and how do you share value with a community, uh, particularly around like, a, you know, a crypto project or whether it's through a token or NFTs or whatever, and so that's that's pretty interesting because it feels like we're back in a period of invention and innovation. Whereas like the past 10 years of Web2 has been more about like a business model, you know, putting things on the internet. So now you can rent a car through the internet or buy a, or get your groceries or the food delivery or whatever. It's like business model changes, right? It's not fundamental human behavior changes. So let's talk about Fractal. It is a NFT gaming marketplace built on the Solana blockchain. We started Fractal, you know, at the end of last year, and it really came from me talking to my co-founder, David. David is uh, at Google. He's a co-creator of Google Drive inside of Google. So just like a really incredible product person. And uh, he was like, we should do something in NFTs. And I was like, okay, well, the next thing in NFTs, I think is gaming. You know, video games online have this tradition of like people valuing virtual goods already for a long time, like over 20 years. And so let's build here because like the idea of putting these virtual goods on a blockchain is like once people already value them it's, it's not that big of a stretch i felt like the future of nfts particularly ones with utility was around gaming and we decided like let's just go in on that and then you know i did have a gaming background which was really helpful why did you build on the solana blockchain david was the one who's like he liked solana because he had been early in the solana ecosystem uh, as a investor and in, in LP actually in a fund, uh, multi-coin. And so he was like excited about Solana. And then he also, you know, thought Solana, which I tend to agree with is like, has one of the most usable experiences, user experiences on, on the blockchain right now for like new users. We think the future is usage on users on the blockchain is like people who haven't even joined yet, right? Uh, most people don't have a crypto wallet, right? Most people aren't buying NFTs. And so in order for us to like actually skate to where the puck is going, we thought like, let's build on on where we think the usability is highest. You know, our goal is to support game companies the best and be where they want to build. Why do you think these NFT marketplaces are the future for gaming? And what elements do you think are important to focus on in order to be successful? Well, the, I, I think that the NFT model, the business model of putting your assets on a blockchain and letting your economy be open is the future of gaming in the sense that it, right now, these the biggest games in the world are giant economies, right? Like everything from Second Life to uh, Fortnite, uh, you know, these are game worlds where people are buying things in the world and they're spending real money. And oftentimes it's billions of dollars, you know, you know, things like Fractal, which is a marketplace, it's kind of an application that sits on top of other people's IP, but then there's also, you know, there could be a lending functions, there could be other people building game experiences on top of your uh, NFTs, you know, existing NFTs. So I think there's just a lot of things that people will build once you open up your economy. And then if you're just taking a royalty on all these transactions, that can be incredibly lucrative. And I think that will become the predominant business model for the biggest games in the world. That's what we're, you know, hoping to enable with Fractal and, um, you know, just getting started right now. We'll see what happens. Yeah, I'm not a, a big gamer myself, but I've been hearing the idea that let's say there's like a sword in the game. You can like NFT that sword. You know, you can think of it as like a blockchain is just a database, right? It's like an open public database. And so in the past, like when someone created, uh, when you bought a virtual good in a game, it was like in the database of that game, right? So like 
when you're done playing the game, that's it. It just sits in that database. There's no, you can't do anything with it. Here in the world where it's on a blockchain, you know, it's an NFT, you know, that sword, when you're done playing the game, maybe you can sell it to someone else or give it to someone else. You can transfer it to someone else. Maybe you can use it to collateralize a loan because other people, you know, it's a very rare sword. And so you need to borrow some money. So you like loan this sword to someone and you borrow against it, right? You uh, can rent it out to someone, you know, maybe it can become a yielding asset for you because other people want to use it. So you like rent it to them. Um, maybe someone else builds a game where you can bring in this sword. And the reason they incorporate other people's NFTs, like this, this sword from this other game, is that they just want uh, the players from that game to come try their experience out. Point is, it's like open and extensible and programmable. Like people can do, kind of build anything they want on top of it. And I think that's the interesting part about like, you know, making the in game things NFTs. What's your ultimate goal with Fractal? Yeah, we want to be this platform that powers this next wave of gaming. You know, I think this is a new business model of gaming and every game is going to become a blockchain game in the future. And so our goal is really to support those developers who are building this future gaming in releasing more and more blockchain games that are, you know, better and better. What we're focused on is just making the customers as happy as possible. Our customers are game developers. Uh, we think if we empower and enable game developers and we do a good job for them, then good things will flow from that. So that's really our focus. Play to earn games is gaining a lot of traction right now, but some traditional gamers and companies, like they're still not convinced. What do you think we can do to help bridge that gap? I think the most important thing is that there have to be more and more successes. And I think that's going to happen. There's so many developers from the traditional gaming world working on games. They're working on blockchain games. In the next 18 to 24 months, some really incredible gaming, you know, blockchain gaming experiences will come out. And then that will convince more developers. And similar to free to play, you know, when free to play started, there was a lot of skepticism around it. Right, this was back in like 2007, 2008, 2009. Before that, most games you paid up front, right, and then you just play the game. And then it shifted to a business model, which was more like the game is free, but you can buy stuff in the game. And it turns out that monetized the users much better. And so when this happened, when it started, people were like, these games are scams. Like they're not good. I want to pay up front. Like people, there was a lot of resistance against this model. And of course, now, 15 years later, this is the predominant business model of gaming, you know, games like Fortnite, the biggest games in the world are on this free to play model. And so, you know, we think that blockchain games are going to be the same where it's like, there's a lot of resistance today, but really it's like much better for both the users and the game companies. This is where the world is headed. Community seems to be the key word in Web3 right now. What do you think is the secret to building that engaged community? Uh, the secret to building an engaged community, uh, it's really just, I think it's listening to the community. People want to feel heard. Uh, they want to participate. I think that's what's interesting about um, you know DAOs and Web3 now is like they're a vehicle, not just for people to invest you know, their money, but also like their time and, and feel like they're heard and really maybe be part of the decision-making process. And I think that's what's exciting to people. Like, I don't know, I, to me, that's what's important. There's this like whole wag me, like to the moon culture that really pumps each other up. Sometimes when a project flops, suddenly that like high support drops. What advice do you have for entrepreneurs or people who are in the community where they're starting a project and it doesn't go the way that they planned? Yeah, that's a good question. I, well, you know, nothing ever goes according to plan. And, uh, you know, you're always going to face adversity or things that don't go as well as you thought. And of course, that is amplified and tougher when people are like screaming about, you know, they invested in something or, you know, the YOLO, their life savings in your NFT and now they're like, it's, it went to zero or the floor price is tanked or something like that. So I think that um, the key is really, you know, you should do things for your prime, where the primary motivation is intrinsic, not extrinsic, right? Like you're not doing it for the approval and adulation of other people, but you're doing it because you enjoy building or you want to work on the specific thing. Um, it's, you know, what help, like, gets you up in the morning. And how did you find like what intrinsically motivates you? Yeah, well, what I love to do is I'm great at sales. I'm great at pitching a vision telling people a story about how the world could be a different way, storytelling aspects of companies. So for me, it's like, can I focus on that and partner with, you know, a co-founder who can like work on, on the, you know, more of like the, the product and, and kind of management side. And so, you know, luckily at Fractal, I have some great co-founders who are, are great partners for me and I get to focus on what I love to do every day. I've seen one of your videos where you say you wouldn't want to be a CEO again. So, and yeah. I think people take um, like CEO and co-founder kind of interchangeably. So can you tell us the difference between the two and why you said you wouldn't be a CEO anymore? 
or if that's sure. still true. It's, yeah, no, that's true. It's, it's definitely true. Like the CEO is responsible. I think in Silicon Valley, when you're the CEO of a company, you're really the person responsible for finding product market fit and being, and, and I think companies like true Silicon Valley companies are product driven companies, right? And so my last company, I didn't do a good job of that because I wasn't really that interested in finding product market fit. The best companies in Silicon Valley you know, are led by product driven CEOs. I don't have the ego anymore. Before like the, the, the part of me that wanted to be a CEO was like the part that was like, oh, Justin, you want to be important. You know, you need to be important in the world and you need to, people need to respect you and like you. And I thought if I was the CEO of a company that would like lend itself to that. And now, you know, I don't need validation from the outside world. I'm like, I know who I am. I'm good with who I am. So I'm like, it doesn't, I don't need to be the CEO of a company. In the past, I think I was very stressed uh, by entrepreneurship because I had a lot of ego and identity tied up in the companies that I was starting. And, you know, if they didn't work out or they weren't going well, then I'd feel like I, things weren't going well for me. You know, what I didn't really realize was at the time was that actually nothing is under your control. Even the things that happen to you in your daily life, why would the outcome of this company be under your control? Number one, it doesn't really matter to the extent that you matter. Like everything that you think of as life or death today, it's like, it's probably going to work out actually. I find that today, if I just focus on what do I love to do? What am I good at? And I just do those things every day and partner with people who are good, you know, and they love to do things that are complementary to what I'm good at, then it's all going to work out in the end. And uh, if we try our best, like, that's great, you know? And so like, I'm not, I don't really stress about what happens. So, I mean, things are going really well right now for Fractal, which is great, but I don't expect that always to be the case. And it's all about, like, I think I have the balance of perspective now to just be like, whatever comes, I'm accepted. How did you get to this point where you're able to balance that perspective? I do a lot of meditation. So, you know, I think that helps a lot. Having a, a meditation practice, I think is really important because you realize like, you know, all experience is just the same thing just different parts of consciousness, but there's no real, you know, good experience or bad experience. There's difficult experiences. There's ones that are easier, but there's, you know, you're just having experiences and like, you don't control them. If you are dissatisfied with the way that you're coping with what's happening to you in your present moment experience, then the way that I learned to deal with it was like to learn to sit, just be still. I just started with headspace actually. It was very simple. Like I was always someone who was really bored and like want to do something, occupy my mind, you know, reading cereal boxes, <laughs> on the breakfast table because I was so bored, right? Like, and so being able to sit for even like a couple of minutes was like a, amazing to me. It was like something I'd never thought I'd be able to do. I think having that tool set in my, uh, you know, my backpack has been really helpful for me to like just navigate the world in a much more calm and collected way. And, and so, you know, I think that's important for an entrepreneur because, you know, I have some friends who are like, oh, doesn't that make you care less? Or like, you're not as, you won't be as successful because you're not as driven, but I don't think that's the case. I think I'll be much more successful because I'm not as compelled to do anything. Like before, when things weren't going well, I'd be like, oh my God, I'd just be scrambling. I'd be, you know, freaked out. I'm like, I want to quit because it's not going well. And there were a lot of compulsive behaviors that flew, like came downstream from that. Whereas now I'm like, oh, if something's not going well, it's like, okay, that's the experience. I don't feel com particularly compelled to do any specific thing, which makes it easier to make a much more rational decision. What I appreciate about you, Justin, is that you're very open to talk about these topics where you know people avoid feeling emotions uh, in real time, which makes us look for outlets of escape and ultimately turn to vices. And I know there are some people who are wary about building out this metaverse, you know, because it might just be another outlet for us to find an escape from reality. What are your thoughts on this? Well, so that, you know, what you just said, described me perfectly before, you know, when things weren't going well in my company, I would like try to find an outlet, right? I was not able to sit with difficult emotions like anxiety or guilt or sadness. And so I would be like, oh, I need to do something to distract myself, right? So I drank a lot, which is definitely not healthy, but then also just simple things like go watch like 10 hours of Netflix, you know, it'd be like, oh, I'm just going to watch a whole TV series or something like that at night. Like after I got home from work, I just like you know, until I fell asleep. So I just have no downtime to be thinking, oh, what about this like difficult experience that I have, I'm having at my company? So eventually like I became able to sit with difficult experiences. I'm like, oh, okay, well, what do I want to do about it? And then I find that's generally like a lot healthier, right? For me, we already have infinite ways to distract ourselves. Like inventing the metaverse isn't creating a whole new way to distract ourselves. There's already like a billion video games that you could be playing like 24 hours a day or TV. So I don't think like layering on metaverses is going to like make any difference. Like either you're going to figure out how to like live with your difficult experiences or not. 
entirely adjacent to like all the other forms of entertainment that are being introduced today. Justin, you talk about conscious leadership a lot as well. How do you instill in your team that they actually have ownership and they are in power of their work instead of being told to execute X, Y, and Z? Yeah. So conscious leadership is a book or it's like a, I guess, leadership philosophy or organizational set of values. Really great a great book. When I read it, it described the values of like a workplace that I would want to work at. And, Mm -hmm. you know, 15 commitments is a lot, but like the, the kind of main three that I really resonate are like, um, you know, take hundred percent responsibility. So you are responsible and you have agency over what's happening around you. That's number one. Uh, uh, the second is approaching things with an open and curious mind. And then the third is like, to bring your whole emotional self to work, you know? And so to me, those were like really important values for a company. I think the way that you instill it in your, in the people at who work at your company is like, you just, you could need to talk about those values, but really more importantly, you need to live them. You know, early on in uh, the history of Fractal, there, there was a hack on our discord and like people's wallets were drained to the tune of like $150,000 worth of uh, Solana. And in the past, I probably would have fl- flown off the handle and been like super, like felt a lot of fear around it probably a negative example to the people around me but instead i'm like here in this case you know i was like oh man i feel you know kind of upset that it happened but like i can acknowledge that and so instead of like becoming angry and spitting myself up in more and more anger i'd be like oh i'm upset i feel that you know where's that in the body i feel like tightness in my chest or like in my jaw or whatever that's where like being angry occurs for me and then i'm like oh, okay like i can just acknowledge that exists and then talk rationally and calmly about like how should we address this issue right like we should figure out how to pay, you know, make the, these people whole and like, um, you know, try to communicate clearly what's happened to the community. And then I was pretty calm. Right. And so people see that example and they, uh, people are mimetic. So they mirror other people's example. Right. So if you like live those values or whatever values are important to you, then that's how you translate them into your company culture. As an investor, what do you look at when you decide to invest in a company? Yeah. Looking for the founders for the most part, it's like, are these people People are going to go the distance. I think people run through walls. Are they curious? Are they always learning? And then in terms of the idea, it's like, like, is there, you know, big idea somewhere inside of this, this idea of what they're working on can grow to something that's, you know, a company that changes the world. Those are the companies that I want to invest in. I've been thoroughly enjoying your content across social media. And as a content creator then, and even now, uh, what advice do you have for people who are trying to get into this creator economy? I think you should do what you love to do. I think a lot of people end up making content, they're in a grind and then they get sick of it because they're making content as a job. And that's like, that can be tough. I think you should just focus on what's the content you would like to make if nobody was watching it. You know, you got to figure out your niche that people resonates with some set of people, but like, then you just got to do that. And if you're doing what you love, then it doesn't matter what happens for me to say that as a rich guy, but like, I really do believe that that, that's like, that's the way to happiness. Yeah. So you studied physics and philosophy at Yale. Why did you decide to pivot into starting Kiko with your peers when I think you had a job already lined up right after graduation? Yeah. So I had a job lined up as like a consultant or it was was like being an energy derivatives trader. I didn't even know what that meant at the time, to be honest. You know, we were starting a company, we got into Y Combinator, which was like nothing back then. It was the first batch of Y Combinator. So we didn't even know what it was, but we had this idea for building this web calendar company. And we, you know, had this opportunity to like start a company. I've always been somebody who's had a sense of adventure. You know, I've had an internal well of confidence in a way. Like I didn't doubt like, oh, I couldn't start a company. I mean, I guess my core ethos has always remained the same, which is just like, fuck it, let's just go and figure it out. When we wanted to start Kiko, we didn't really know how it was going to work or what the business model was. We just like, we're like, let's build, start building. And today when I want to start Fractal 18 years later, I'm like, let's just start building something and we'll figure it out. And it's worked out. You only have to have one success every like decade in order to be rich, you know? So I just keep trying new things. Some of them don't work. Some of them will work. You know, I'm pretty confident in that now. And uh, as long as I'm learning, I'm having fun, you know? Mm -hmm. Justin, what does success mean to you? For me, success is like, am I good father and husband and friend? And like, am I the person, do I get to show up as a person that I want to be in the world? Um, To me, that's success. I want to talk about that a little more, like your life now as a father and a husband. How is that balance with starting Fractal? You know, I think it's important that you just set limits of like, when is family time and when are you going to spend time with your, with the people that you love? Like you should set those limits as like, you know, kind of the most important. And then outside of that, it's like really important to work hard, you know? So for me, it's easy because I like to work because I don't do things I don't like to do, at least not very much selling and recruiting and 
all that stuff. Like I get to, I could do that at any time, you know, I'll get on the phone at like 9 PM to do that. You know, I'll talk to people on the weekend to do that. Cause I like to do it. It's fun for me. Now, obviously some of the time in the world in a startup, you're not always going to be able to do things that you like to do, but as long as you try to balance it towards the things you like to do, there's always someone that you can work with who likes to do the stuff that you don't like to do. That's the magic of human beings is there's like different types of people. What are you most excited for with Fractal? You know, we have a lot of games uh, that are coming out with their drops and you can find them all on fractal.is. We've got a lot of like product in the works to help uh, scale blockchain games to more and more users and make their onboarding easier. And so I'm, I'm really excited for, for the those products that we're rolling out. I think that's going to be really cool. Yeah, I'm excited for everything that's going to unfold with Fractal. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time today. I learned so Amazing. much from you. Thank you, Jazzy. Thanks for listening to this episode of Wellversed. If you enjoyed learning with me today, please make sure to like and subscribe. Have a blessed day and see you in the next one.